Good afternoon. I will call to order this remote meeting of the House Commerce Committee and ask Mr. Brown to take the roll. Chair Stevenson. Present. Vice Chair Cortiza Watoon. Here. Representative O'Driscoll. Here. Representative Barr. Here. Representative Carlson. Here. Representative Davney. Representative Elkins. Present. Representative Haley. Representative Cagle. Present. Representative Lee. Lee present. Representative Lilly. Lilly present. Representative Liz Lagarde, excused. Representative Lucero. Present. Representative Olson. Present. Representative Farr. Present. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen present. Representative Richardson. Present. Representative Tice. I'll uh, call again Representative Daphne. Daphne present. Representative Haley. Haley present. Representative Tice. I know she said she's having some connection problems, so. Um, I'm okay, I'm oh, here. There you are, thank you. All right, uh, we have a quorum and the first item of business is approval of minutes from our last meeting. Representative Katiza Watoon, have you had a chance to uh, review the minutes from our last meeting? Mr. Chair, I have, and I would um, move the minutes from March 2nd. Any discussion to the Katiza Watoon motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion prevails and the minutes for March 2nd, 2021 are adopted. We have four uh, bills on the agenda today. The first two are uh, from Representative Schultz. I think we will take up House File 1002 first. Uh, I will move House File 1002 be recommended to be referred to the Committee on Health, Finance, and Policy. Representative Schultz, welcome to the committee. I believe you have an author's amendment. Should we take that before we, uh, before you describe the bill or? Do we have Representative Schultz? Maybe not, okay. Uh, I will rescind my motion and we will do a different bill while we wait for Representative Schultz. Uh, do we have Representative Bernardi? I'm seeing nodding. Are you there, Representative Bernardi? Well, I know Representative Lippert had to uh, uh, take up a bill in another committee first. And while we are waiting for bill authors, I think we will have to take a recess. So I will uh, recess the committee and uh, we will convene again once we have some bill authors.
All right, I will call back to order the meeting of the House Commerce Committee. We have uh, Representative Schultz in the Zoom now, and I will uh, move House File 1002 to be recommended to be referred to the Committee on Health Finance and Policy. Representative Schultz, welcome to the committee. I see you have an author's amendment. Should we take that up first before we, uh, before we describe the bill? Thank you, Chair Stevenson. Yes, I, I would um, like that to be moved by you if possible. It's a DE, I think it's a DE2 amendment. Uh, I have it as the DE1. DE1, sorry, DE1. I will move the DE1 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author would like the committee to consider. Uh, Representative Schultz, I don't know if you want to briefly describe the DE1. Um, it's the entire bill. So could we adopt it and then I could describe the, the bill. Happy Thank to you. Do that. Is there any discussion to the DE1? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the DE1 say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails and the DE1 is adopted. Representative Schultz, to your bill. Well, thank you, Chair Stevenson and members for hearing this bill. This bill um, puts into state law, if passed, the protections of the Affordable Care Act. And it does that because there's concerns that the United States Supreme Court may, um, may make the ACA not enforceable and may strike it down. So what this bill does, um, and these there were two bills that were introduced last session, incorporates the language of both those bills, House File 3169 carried by Representative Cantrell and House File 4335 carried by Representative Richardson. So um, the first section of the bill, I, I guess I won't go section by section. I'll just tell you what, overall what it does. Um, and then we, I'll be stand for questions, but it puts a three month grace period for unpaid premiums in Minnesota statute rather than relying on the ACA. It puts a 90 day limit on waiting periods that group plans may impose before coverage starts in Minnesota statute. It makes co-payments, co-insurance and deductible language for HMOs consistent with state and federal law rather than consistent with the ACA provisions. Preventive items and services that are covered without cost sharing. This bill um, relied on the Commerce Department to determine these items and the existing list is the minimum list. Removes the ACA reference and language that allows individuals to remain on their parents' coverage up to age 26. For out-of-pocket limits, in addition to eliminating the annual and lifetime maximums for coverage, the ACA limits out-of-pocket expenses. And we've had Commerce determine this maximum annual out-of-pocket limit applicable to individual health plans and small group health plans. And it puts anti-discrimination protections into Minnesota statute. It also puts in essential benefits uh, into Minnesota law. Um, it puts in the metal levels, the bronze, silver, um, gold metal levels into Minnesota law. And there's language regarding risk pooling. Um, the, the language in the ACA on other items, I think are already in existing statute under 62A65 and on gender-based pricing, that language is also already in state statute. So that's the bulk of the, of the bill um, as amended. And I know we probably have um, the, uh, probably the Minnesota Council of Health Plans may wanna testify on, on this bill. You are very correct that they have uh, signed up to testify. And so uh, we'll turn next to Dan Andreessen from the Minnesota Council of Health Plans. Mr. Andreessen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Again, Dan Andreessen with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans. Uh, just briefly and mainly the language I was just added with the DE amendment and just wanted to raise a couple points. With that language, we would like to make sure that there isn't a conflict being created with federal law and also be mindful of the operational challenge to blink off one law and turn on another one uh, without significant planning. Uh, we would urge that if this language is intended to replace the ACA, that the language match up to that which is in federal law. Otherwise, we're going to have a state law that conflicts with federal law. Uh, we're still evaluating the language in the ACA, but for instance, we have found a discrepancy in the language on premium grace periods that's in section four, subdivision 2A. Um, under the ACA, those, re those receiving advanced premium tax credits through the exchange have a 90-day grace period, while those not receiving tax credits have a 30-day period. The language in the, in the DE extends this grace period for 90 days to everyone in the exchange, but also to the entire small group market and those purchasing off the exchange. 
So we would, for, we would urge further discussion if the intent is to go beyond federal laws that carriers currently comply with within the ACA. And also remind members that the ACA is more than just the policy provisions in the, D, the DE. The ACA has several components regarding federal funding for tax credits and Medicaid expansion. So a lot's gonna change the state level if the ACA is repealed. And, I, and if that occurs, I would expect a significant amount of policy work being needed by all impacted parties. So as this bill goes forward, we would recommend also uh, looking at the effective date for these changes. It may be best to have that date tied to the repeal of the ACA, but also ensure that we're not making changes in the middle of a plan year. Um, and I've spoken to uh, Representative Schultz about this suggestion and uh, plan to continue to discuss this as the bill moves on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andreessen. There are no other uh, testifiers who have signed up to speak uh, on the bill. Uh, so we will turn now to member questions and discussion. Are there any questions or discussion uh, to the bill? Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to the bill author, a couple of questions. Um, in the conversation that we had um, at the beginning in her setup, she was uh, indicating, Representative Schultz, that um, you wanted to try to mirror in state statute the provisions from the ACA, but that's not happening because you're expanding that. Um, and you suggested that a case that's not before the United States Supreme Court may be coming at some point. So I'm just wondering if you can, can explain to the committee and to, to others why we would be looking at a case that doesn't exist before the Supreme Court that we'd have to enshrine in state statute, the ACA, plus make changes that we don't even see in the ACA. Just need some more explanation and understanding of that, if I could. Mr. Representative Chair, Schultz. Author. Thank you, Representative O'Driscoll and Chair Stevenson. So, you know, I think we all share the goal, or I hope we do, that we want to make sure people have access to health care and affordable health care. And millions of people across the country were able to get coverage through the ACA. And if that is eliminated, that option is eliminated, we will see millions of people be kicked off insurance and not have access to affordable health care. And so I think we want to prevent that from happening. We want to be prepared as a state. Um, and, our, and our goal is to make sure more people have coverage that they can afford and have the health care that they can that they need to stay alive and stay healthy and have a high quality of life. So I think that it's always better to prepare, be prepared and have these conversations now. Um, if things do change and, ha and we'd have to come back to special session, we would have done some work already as a legislative body on, on these initiatives and it started that discussion. So that's why I think it's important to bring this forward. And I believe it, and I'll have to check with the intent of the original authors of this language that um, I've added as a DE amendment um, to make sure that um, there's consistency across um, people's, uh, when they choose different health insurance covered options, that we have some consistency of how people are treated when they're purchasing insurance. Any follow up Representative Driscoll? Uh, yes, I do. Um... Mr. Chair, uh, to the bill author again, um, can you discuss for me the timeline you believe that the Supreme Court might be taking this up when um, you say to be prepared? Again, with nothing pending, that could be five, seven, 10 years out. Um, do you think that it might be a little bit in haste that we would be looking at um, doing something, particularly um, with President Obama's commitment to um, the ACA or Obamacare that he was also a part of. Um, I'm just wondering if we're borrowing problems here. Well, I don't, I can't, spec Schultz. thank you, Chair Stevenson. I can't speculate on the outcome of what's in front of the, the, the Supreme Court right now. And with the makeup changing in the Supreme Court, I don't know what that outcome will be. Now with the new Biden administration, there might only be a small probability that it gets repealed, but working with, um, Mr. Andreessen and the other health plans through the council, um, we can. We are thinking of offering language that suggests this will be um, effective if it is in fact repealed. And Representative Driscoll, I, maybe I, I missed something in the conversation here, and I apologize if, if that happened. But it, isn't it the case that there's a, a challenge to the ACA in the Supreme Court uh, pending right now? Um, well, Mr. Chair. Is. Mr. Chair, I'm, my questions were to the bill author, um, since she was the one that brought it up. I was hoping that she could enlighten me on that. Uh, I was not aware of any challenges that are pending in the courts right now. There might be. Um, but I, I do have some additional follow-up questions for the bill author, if of I course. might be permitted. 
Oh, of course. Um, to the to the bill author, can you speak to the 90 day grace period that you're talking about for non payments and why that's not a part of the ACA that you're trying to replicate in the state statute? And we want to we want to put that into to Minnesota statute. Well, I think, thank you, Chair Stevenson and Representative O'Driscoll. I believe it's a 30 day requirement under the ACA, and this is to provide um, more continuity of coverage for that grace period. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Schultz, to that point, um, I will just conclude my comments with this. If we're moving from a 30 day to a 90 day um, grace period, does that help people? Well, I'm gonna step back to the fact that we've had some, some difficulties with our local exchange here in Minnesota, where we've had a number of the carriers that have pulled back and some have through the reinsurance program that's been very successful, chose to step back into the, uh, the arena to offer coverage. Do you think that um, insurance companies having to pay claims for 90 days without receiving payment is gonna incentivize them to want to stay in the exchange or to want to withdraw from the exchange if it moves from a 30 to a 90 day time period? Representative Schultz. Thank you, Chair Stevenson, Representative O'Driscoll. I think that would be a question for um, Mr. Andreessen. So if he's willing to respond, um, I'm not gonna speculate on what they would do. I would defer to Commerce or Mr. Andreessen. Uh, Mr. Andreessen, if you're available. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Driscoll, I, I think it's kind of complicated because it's also tied to, you know, the current grace periods are tied to the advanced premium tax credit and who knows what the fate of that will be and if the state would create a new tax credit. So there's a lot moving right now um, and it's hard to know what part of the ACA would be struck down and what the feds would maybe pick up. So. Um, it's hard to kind of answer that question right now. Representative O'Driscoll. Again, I'm just going to finish on this comment. So I think Mr. Andreessen's points were well made that we are speculating on something that may or may not happen on parts of a law that may or may not be struck down on a uh, set of moving parts, but we're going to try to enshrine this into state statute right now in anticipation of something that we don't know what's going to happen. Um, which could, could again, in the long run, affect people's ability through the exchange to get insurance because carriers may uh, find it difficult to, to participate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Haley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Schultz. I guess uh, just a, a tag along um, to what Representative O'Driscoll said, I'm just concerned that we're voting on this today um, when we're not clear that yeah, there's going to be any federal change. Um, and we're not clear that your language here in this DE really mirrors the ACA language. Uh, and I don't know that the chair would want to take the time. I could ask uh, nonpartisan staff to run through that for it for us. Um, but I don't know that you want to take the time to do that today, chair. Um, I guess I'm suggesting, would the author be open to a friendly amendment that would say um, that this language would mirror the ACA language and only be effective in the event that the ACA is repealed. Representative Schultz. I'm not comfortable uh, with an, an oral amendment, but I can assure you, Representative Haley, that I'm gonna be working with the health plans on something similar, but it, it won't exactly mirror the ACA um, because we have some unique features in Minnesota and also, um, I just, I, I, I'm just concerned that if we offer an oral amendment, we, we're putting a you know, burden on staff, but also I want to make sure the language is correct. And I know it has another committee stop, which we can offer that a similar amendment. And I'm happy you know, to, to ha work with you as well on that amendment um, to satisfy your concerns. Any follow-up, Representative Haley? Uh, yes, thank you, Representative Schultz. Uh, Mr. Chair, are we voting on this today? Or are we laying it over? Uh, we are voting it out of committee. It does have another committee staff after uh, this, and it sounds like Representative Schultz would be happy to work with you on uh, your concerns between now and then. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for those reasons, I'll probably be a pass on this vote, uh, but thank you for uh, indulging me in the questions. Representative Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, I just want to thank Representative Schultz for this legislation. Uh, I think 
we all have heard from constituents about the positive impact that Obamacare made in their lives when they were suddenly able to access health care that had been out of reach previously, when the, the importance of being able to keep a uh, young adult child, uh, many sometimes with meaningful medical needs, uh, on health insurance when their own employer uh, didn't offer it when, because of the way the business community has stepped away from that social compact, uh, any number of, of pricing issues and, and the like. Um, so we've seen the impact. We know that it is under threat. And Representative Schultz, you're doing exactly what we were all elected to do, which is look down the lane and lead not wait to be reactive after something has happened, but anticipate and plan. And that's what our constituents want us to do. They also want health care. So thank you for this. I look forward to voting in the affirmative. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to, to piggyback on what uh, Representative Babney just said, uh, I have heard from my constituents. I've been hearing from my constituents for years, and it has been the overwhelming majority has been the complaints and the hardships inflicted by Obamacare years. For many, many years in a row, there it was 50, 100, 150, 200% premium increases, co-pay increases, out-of-pocket expenses. And in fact, I remember one particular young couple, both math teachers, high school math teachers, both in their late 20s when I was door knocking in Otsego. And I've told the story on the house floor. And they said that they are very concerned. This, so this would have been about five, four or five years ago, right in the midst of the year after year, 100% plus premium and other increases. They were very concerned about their future and what the direct threat that ACA has caused and the hardship imposed on them and people in their age bracket and uh, within their spheres. And so uh, I appreciate the, the olive branch that Representative Schultz has extended to satisfy concerns, but there is nothing she could do, change, or amend in her language to satisfy any of my concerns. I look forward to the ACA being struck down, and I sincerely hope it does, because in Minnesota here, I can't speak for other states, but in Minnesota, we had a much more uh, cost-effective health plans, much more affordable. A, uh, the ACA has been the antithesis of affordable. I look forward to the days when we can have cheaper health care coverage that allows more people to actually expand and have care. Thank you. It's always uh, uh, a pleasure for me to see uh, uh, Republicans cheer on activist judges. So thank you, Representative Lucero, for your call for uh, an activist court to strike down the bill. Representative Cagle. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I just wanted to kind of bring this back. I actually was not able to get health care prior to the Affordable Care Act, um, having three back surgeries before I was 30. This was something that um, as a young, healthy person, um, it was just something that was unattainable for me. And so um, I think that anything we can do to make sure that people don't end up, end up in the situation that I was in um, is good. So thank you very much. Right, I don't see any uh, further discussion to the bill. Any closing comments, Representative Schultz? Thank you, Chair Stevenson, and to Representative Lucero. You know, I think we all share the concern that even today, healthcare is expensive for many families, and we need to work together to address that issue. And you know, if the ACA is struck down or no, big components of it um, are repealed, we need to be ready to look at those high costs. And I'm not seeing a lot of alternatives out there being worked on um, in a bipartisan way. And so I'm, I'm happy to work with you, Representative Lucero, on initiatives to make it more affordable. But the ACA, in fact, did make it more affordable for many, many families in Minnesota through the subsidies. And right now in the federal stimulus package, we're seeing language that continues to work and build off the ACA to make it more affordable through additional subsidies, eight and a half percent income cap that you wouldn't pay more than 8.5% of your income. And historically families were paying before the ACA 30% of their income or more on their health insurance. So there are, I'm looking forward to the, the passage of the stimulus package um, and the enactment of those additional subsidies. Um, and uh, funding to families and to our state so we can 
um, do initiatives to make it health care and health insurance more affordable for people of our state. Thank you, Representative Schultz. Uh, I will renew my motion that House File 1002, as amended, be recommended to be referred to the Committee on Health Finance and Policy. Mr. Brown will take the roll and the chair votes aye. Vice Chair Cortizo Attune. Aye. Representative O'Driscoll. No. Representative Barr. No. Representative Carlson. Aye. Representative Davney. Aye. Representative Elkins. Aye. Representative Haley. Pass. Representative Cagle. Aye. Representative Lee. Lee, aye. Representative Lilly. Lilly, aye. Representative Liz Lagarde, excused. Representative Lucero. No. Representative Olson. Aye. Representative Farr. No. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, pass. Representative Richardson. Aye. Representative Tice. No. With 10 ayes and five nays, the motion prevails and House File 1002 as amended is recommended to be referred to the Committee on Health Finance and Policy. The next bill on the agenda is also our Representative Schultz bill, uh, House File 1516. I will move House File 1516 be recommended to be referred to the Committee on Health Finance and Policy. Representative Schultz, to your bill. Thank you, Chair Stevenson and members. Thank you for hearing this bill today. This is the bill, what we're calling the biosimilar bill. And it addresses the problem of very expensive biologics and barriers to getting the like the generic equivalent biosimilar um, out in and being used among individuals, patients, and um, being distributed by our providers and hospitals. So this bill is we've been working on this bill for several years. One of my constituents is here to testify, David Spurl. Um, and it was, he brought this idea to me. And then I was at a conference at the Mayo Clinic and met others that, at the Mayo Clinic interested in this idea. And um, there's been a lot of work to do on this, done on this bill. And I'm glad we're finally getting to hear it this year. But um, I'll just tell you a, a little bit of background and then go to my testifiers. So right now, um, since 2014, brand name biologic drugs have accounted for more than 90% of prescription drug spending growth. So this is an area where we're spending a significant amount of money on many individuals who need these drugs. It's thousands of dollars per month out of pocket, and it's becoming very unaffordable. Um, and there's something called rebate traps that are used by brand name manufacturers, and these have been pretty well documented that brand name companies threaten to, re to remove rebates if um, they provide uh, other biosimilars, if, put the, if they put those biosimilars on their formulary or use them. So they're really trying to keep that monopoly that they have. And we're trying to open up the market, reduce the monopolistic behavior and have more competition between biosimilars and biologics. Other countries have been much more successful at getting biosimilars out and being used in the market. Um, and they benefit from lower prices through that competition. And that's what this bill is trying to uh, or attempting to do. So I will now turn it over to um, the first testifier. Thank you, Chair Stevenson. Thank you, Representative Schultz. Uh, the first uh, testifier is David Spurl. Mr. Spurl. Thank you, Chair Stevenson and committee members for the opportunity to weigh in on this uh, important issue to healthcare here in Minnesota. Um, my name is David Spurl. I'm a pharmacist at Essentia Health and I'm here with my colleagues, Andrew Askew, Molly Skifstead and Roseanne Hines. And today we're asking for your support of House File 1516, a bill that allows providers to prescribe biosimilar products in a manner that focuses on safety and helps to drive down the costs of, of these medications. So as the committee considers this legislation, I'd, I'd ask you to imagine that you're a patient who has debilitating joint pain or a new diagnosis of cancer, because these are the medications that treat um, some of our most severe diseases, our cancer patients, rheumatoid arthritis uh, patients, patients with severe chronic gastric diseases. Your doctor who you know and trust discusses the various options with you and prescribes you the medication that's best suited for your condition and also the most affordable option. And understandably, you'd want to start this medication right away. Uh, but after getting your prescription, you now find out that because it's a biosimilar not covered by your insurance, your treatment's actually delayed. And your doctor is forced to prescribe a different medication that's identical and clinically the same, 
um, but it's far more expensive and requires you to pay more out of pocket. Finally, imagine that once you get this medication finally covered by your insurance, you find that in changing your medication, your doctor made an error and prescribed the wrong dose due to confusion uh, caused by the complexity of switching medications that was required by your insurance. This is the reality for our doctors, pharmacists, and other healthcare providers every day with the class of medications called biologics and their biosimilars. As Representative Schultz outlined, these are a newer class of medications that have no difference in safety, purity, or of effectiveness when compared to the originator biologic medication. So biosimilars have really uh, been a major opportunity for us in healthcare to improve care and drive down costs. They drive down costs much like generic medications have done for years for those um, who have, have worked with generic medications before. So despite all this promise, as I demonstrated in the patient scenario and discussed by the Institute of Safe Medication Practices, there are various safety concerns regarding the current payer-driven system that we have for prescribing biologic medications. For example, in order to satisfy all the different payer requirements, and, and we can think about an organization like Essentia Health, where we have multiple uh, states, multiple communities, lots of different payers, we, a healthcare provider has to ensure that we have all of the different inventory of the different biologics and biosimilar medications, which adds significant complexity um, that's really unnecessary. So by requiring insurance coverage parity for all biosimilar medications, this bill will allow for doctors and patients actually to choose the medication that's safest and brings the optimal value to the patient. In addition to these safety implications, biological medications are the most significant cost driver of prescription drug spending in the United States as Representative Schultz laid out. They've been cited to account for almost 40% of the total drug spending overall. So a huge, a huge chunk of this issue. The current system set up by medical and pharmacy benefit managers and the pharmaceutical industry brand manufacturers has limited the ability for patients to benefit from these new medications due to the rebate traps and other anti-competitive technique or uh, tactics. At Essentia Health, um, even through the stresses placed on us by the pandemic, we continue to work hard as an accountable care organization to provide high value cost effective care to our patients and really truly align with our patients around reducing the overall cost of their care. We've worked closely with the physicians at our organization to review the biologic medications and their associated biosimilars. And we actually utilize these medications many times every day. Unfortunately, Due to the different payer restrictions, not all of our patients are able to utilize certain biosimilar medications and realize the savings associated with their use. Currently, there are 28 approved biosimilar medications. And Mr. Spurl, I'm sorry oh, to interrupt. I'm gonna have to ask you to, to, to absolutely. wrap up your testimony. Yes, absolutely. Last, last statement here. So um, there are these 28 uh, approved biosimilars, but there will be an expanded growth over the next couple of years. And so we are really, uh, hopeful to address this issue now um, on the front end of, of this growing issue. So for the, these reasons, we respectfully request your support of, of House File 1516. Thank you so much, Chair Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Spurl. The next testifier uh, is, apologies, Eric uh, Tucci from Mayo. Yes, thank you for your time today, Chair Stevenson. I also want to thank Representative Schultz for her continued support for this important legislation. Uh, I do want to uh, delve a little bit deeper into some of the sort of cost savings advantages of this legislation. Um, this is a, an academic area of interest to myself, and I'm also a vice chair of supply chain management responsible for the pharmaceutical formulary for Mayo Clinic. So I have uh, s similar uh, to Dr. Spurl, um, a lot of relevant firsthand experience. So Biologic agents actually account for 14 of the top 25 highest expenditure drugs in the U.S. Uh, these cover th conditions such as um, insulin, cancer, uh, inflammatory conditions, and immunologic diseases. Um, many of these drugs have been on the market for multiple decades, and they've never faced competition until these biosimilars came on the market. And uh, really, they're the most powerful tool that we have to control and reduce the cost of, of drugs in the U.S., um, the purpose of this legislation is really just to simplify and streamline the process so that, as Dr. Sproul mentioned, uh, providers can quickly and efficiently and safely get these uh, 
more cost-effective prescriptions to our patients. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, about this legislation. All right, well, we will now move on to the public uh, testimony period. Uh, the first uh, person to sign up to testify is Judy Cook. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Judy Cook with Cook Girard Associates. On behalf of the Association for Accessible Medicines and the Biosimilar Council, we want to thank Representative Schultz for being a real champion for increased take up of biosimilars in the marketplace as a way to provide significant cost savings on prescription drugs for Minnesotans. Biosimilars have saved Americans over $4.5 billion in the last 10 years with $2.2 billion in 2019. Nationally, biosimilars are projected to save over $100 billion through 2024. We do have some questions about the bill language and want to make sure the legislation achieves the goals that will result in greater use of biosimilars and the savings it can provide. We appreciate working with the bill author and all the stakeholders who have talked about the benefits of biosimilars as this bill moves forward. I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then our last testifier is Michelle Mack. Michelle, uh, Ms. Mack. Good afternoon, Chairman Stevenson and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michelle Mack and I'm a director at the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, PCMA. PCMA represents America's PBMs or pharmacy benefit managers. PBMs are engaged by clients to manage pharmacy benefits pursuant to health insurance benefits and contracts. PBMs only manage pharmacy benefits that occur in the prescription drug benefit. So any prescription drugs given in a hospital setting are not covered under the prescription drug benefit, but under the medical insurance plan. I'm here today to provide our perspective and respectively testify in opposition of House File 1516. We applaud Representative Schultz and her stated goal to use this legislation to increase the use of biosimilars and thus decrease the cost for consumers. Increasing competition in this evolving market can surely lead to lower costs to Minnesotans. Years ago, the PBMs were instrumental in supporting the federal law that was enacted to grant the Food and Drug Administration the ability to create the framework under which biosimilars are approved. And today still, we strongly support the increase in development and use of these drugs. Unfortunately, the sponsor's goal of increasing the use of biosimilars and lowering costs to consumers may not be achieved. House File 1516 expressly limits PBM tools, such as formulary, formulary development and management specific to biosimilars, effectively hamstringing PBMs and plans where these tools are needed most. This bill creates an open formulary for these drugs, and this will only lead to increased costs because there will be no incentive for the manufacturers of these drugs to compete on price. In addition to our concerns that cost savings may not be the result of the legislation, we also have a few questions for the bill proponents, which are, there is no requirement that the health systems purchase these drugs at the lowest net cost. There has been discussion about this saving the patient money, but we don't see language in the bill that references this. And we question why the public health care programs and the state employee group insurance plan are exempted from this bill. We appreciate the study language to evaluate the impact of the legislation after the bill has become law, but we would recommend, however, that it might make more sense to conduct this research and analysis on the front, analysis on the front end to determine the intended and untended consequences on the stakeholders impacted by this bill. Thank you, and I appreciate the committee's time and attention to our concerns and am available for questions. Thank you. Uh, with no further testifiers, we'll move to member discussion and questions. And I'll start by saying, uh, Representative Schultz, I remember when you brought this bill to this committee uh, last uh, biennium, and uh, I liked it then, and I, I like it now. I wonder, and I, as I recall, it passed with a very strong bipartisan uh, vote out of the committee. I wonder if you could talk about any differences between the, the version from last year and this year, Representative Schultz. This is the same version that was heard um, we amended it in your committee. So it's the bill that was amended in your committee or in commerce, sorry, and brought that bill forward here. And it does have bipartisan support in the house and it's being care, um, chief authored by Senator Nelson in the Senate. Um, and there seems to be a lot of bipartisan support. Um, so I'm grateful that you've, you've heard it and ready for questions. Great, Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you must have been reading my mind, Mr. Chair, because my question, uh, I have a couple questions, but my first one was the same as yours because I remember 
uh, hearing this bill as well, Representative Schultz, uh, I served on you know, HHS finance uh, last session uh, with you. And some of the, the concerns that I've heard from stakeholders on this bill are the same as last uh, time. So I'm, I guess I'm trying to kind of figure out in my mind why haven't some changes been made since your last version? And can you speak to that at all? Representative Schultz. Thank you, Representative Haley and, and Chair Stevenson. So we did we did um, get together with stakeholders and um, could not we don't yet have agreement on um, different language to address some of those concerns. We're going to continue those conversations um, about that language, um, but there's um, no agreement, and there are more there are now more stakeholders that have been brought to the table. So it's getting a little bit more complicated. But um, we will continue to work together to get an agreement. Our, this bill may look different than the Senate bill, so I think we'll have time if it goes to conference committee as a standalone bill to continue that work. Any follow-up, Representative Haley? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Schultz. I just I appreciated hearing that, that there's still a work in progress here on some of these issues. Um, my second question, curious, as to why uh, Minnesota Care and CGIP formularies and MA are excluded. Um, you know, I share your concern about high cost of pharmaceuticals and, and different ways that we can um, help all stakeholders and all constituents bring those costs down. So um, explain to me a little bit your decision of focusing this on the private market, but our, our public market doesn't have to abide by the same formulary rules. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Representative Haley, for that really good question. Um, you know, we do think that they will benefit if competition works as it should and biosimilars um, drive the price down for the brand name biologics. And so we should see savings in our CGIP and public programs, but doing the fiscal note is very complicated if we include them initially because of how the rebate structure works and the proprietary information that wouldn't be disclosed in the fiscal note. So for that reason, we are excluding them initially and we're going to we added a rates or a study language into the bill to study their experience in CGIP and in our public programs compared the, to the experience in the commercial market, and then come back and uh, make those changes if we need to to the CGIP and include them um, in this bill if it passes. But initially, um, it's just because of the complexity of conducting a fiscal note with the with the rebate structure that exists. Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So Representative Schultz, just for constituents that may be watching, um, is it a fair statement to say the state programs benefit greatly from rebate structures as well? Representative Schultz. Um, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's the state or the, how the pass-through works. And so we're still learning and the Senate bill is a little bit different. So we may, we may see a different type of fiscal note from the Senate bill um, and learn from that. But um, right now I'm, I'm learning more about how the rebate structure and who actually benefits because it varies between the fee-for-service part of the public program and the managed care component on who actually benefits. So um, to be determined, but I'll, I will let you know as soon as I find out and learn. Representative Hill. Thank you, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No follow-up. All right. And seeing no further uh, members seeking recognition, I'll ask Representative Schultz if she has any closing comments. I do not. I look forward to continue the work on the bill and for the next committee stop um, where we could have an amendment and I'll keep the committee members posted. Thank you, Representative Schultz. I will renew my motion that House File 1516 be recommended to be referred to the Committee on Health Finance and Policy, and Mr. Brown will take the roll, and the chair votes aye. Vice Chair Cortizo Watoon. Aye. Representative O'Driscoll. No. Representative Barr. No. Representative Carlson. Aye. Representative Daphne. Aye. Representative Elkins. Aye. Representative Haley. No. Representative Kegel. Representative Lee. Lee, aye. Representative Lilly. Lilly, aye. Representative Lucero. No. Representative Olson. Aye. Representative Farr. No. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, no. Representative Richardson. Aye. Representative Tice. Aye. Aye. Uh, no, I'm going to go with no instead. 
Thank you. With nine ayes and uh, seven nays, the motion prevails and House File 1516 is recommended to be referred to the Committee on Health, Finance and Policy. Thank you, Representative Schultz. Thank uh, you, thank you, members. Next on the agenda is House File 80. Uh, welcome to the committee, Representative Lippert. Uh, I will move House File 80 be recommended to be referred to the Committee on Agricultural Finance and Policy and Representative Lippert to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Under the Farmer Lender Mediation Act, if you are a farmer that has at least $15,000 in debt called by the bank, you can enter into the mediation with your lender or lenders. At that point, you have 90 days to work out an agreement, 90 days until the bank can enforce the debt. The Farmer Lender Mediation Program has been very helpful for farmers, giving farmers more support as they seek to find a resolution to the debt challenges that they face. The Farmer Lender Mediation Program will need to be reauthorized by 2022. This bill reauthorizes the Farmer Lender Mediation Program until the year 2027. Also, as we've been having conversations about extending mediation timeframe due to the challenges posed by COVID-19, Mary Nell Priestler, the director of the program, who will testify, shared in the Agriculture Committee that the normal 90-day timeframe often isn't enough time, that it's often rushed in this 90 day period the mediation process is. Since then, I've had conversation with farm advocates and more farmers and they agreed that more time would be helpful. This bill extends the time frame for mediation from 90 days to 120 days. As I talked with a constituent yesterday who had been through farmer lender mediation, he said, even with a farm advocate on your side and a mediator, you're out of your depth as a farmer. There should be a six month period for mediation, he said. Another 30 days is the least we can ask for. When I was in mediation, I had 26 people on the other side of the table representing many different creditors. It's hard to get that done, all of that resolution, um, come to resolution with all those creditors in 90 days. So my focus is doing all we can to keep farmers on the farm. We need a future in Minnesota with more farmers, not less. The reauthorization is, realign, is aligned with this value, as is providing farmers with a little more time to find a mediated resolution with their lenders. At this time, I'll turn to our testifiers. And uh, first on my list, at least, is Mary Nell Priestler. Now we will recognize Mary Nell Priestler. Ms. Priestler. I'm Mary Nell Priestler. I'm the executive director for the Farmer Lender Mediation Program, Chair Stevenson, and members of the committee. The Farmer Lender Mediation Program helps farmers and lenders work out solutions for managing agricultural debt. Successful mediation requires compromise on the part of the debtor and creditor. Farmers may have to change their operation to make it profitable or liquidate assets. Creditors may need to restructure debt and security or reschedule loan payments. The existing timeline in the state statute is 90 days to conduct mediation. However, with the notifications required under the state statute, we end up with 60 days for mediation sessions. We often find that this is not enough time to execute a final agreement. The outbreak of COVID-19 brings more uncertainty regarding commodity prices, government programs, and the broader economy. Many are selling assets, closing businesses, tightening family living expenses, and depending on non-farm income. The extension of the timeline is warranted. It takes longer to have any legal work completed, surveys, updates of abstracts, obtain purchase agreements, loan applications, work with government agencies, waiting for interpretation and clarification of USDA programs, completion of financial information, consulting for tax ramifications of liquidations, and wait for farmers and lenders to recover from COVID-19. In the future, the goal is to resume face-to-face -face mediations. Thank you for your support of the Farmer Lender Mediation Program. Thank you. Uh, the next testifier I have on the list is Nancy Dolan. Ms. Dolan. Do we have Ms. Dolan? Maybe we'll move to the next one. And if uh, Ms. Dolan's available, we can come back to her. Uh, the next testifier I have is Peter Ripka. Mr. Ripka. 
Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> my name is Peter Ripka for the record. Um, thank you, Chair Stevenson and members of the committee for hearing me today. I am a farmer who just finished um, my second round of farmer lender mediation. Um, I also work with uh, Minnesota Farmers Union <clears throat> now. I joined the, the MFU team after an injury that prevented me to continue my dairy operation. Based on my experience with farmer lender mediation, um, as has already been said, there's usually more than just one creditor that's involved. So it takes a lot of time to put everything together with your financial team. I used farm business management and for a while there was no face-to-face -face meetings, so it was nearly impossible to do. Um, even out, because outside the pandemic, the lenders are continually changing. Since I, when I first started farming, my lenders were local. And by the time I got done here, my local lender had, was headquartered in Iowa. So it was hard to get definite answers. Even though you were talking to somebody local, they had to turn around and get an answer from somewhere else. Yeah, that, it's not, so it's not similar to what happened in the 80s where most of it was local. And finally, it's important to um, extend this timeline. My first mediation was actually last year when the timeline got extended, which worked and was beneficial to both parties to work through that situation. Um, it's hard to get all that paperwork done in a month and then get back and forth. And then my last mediation session, I was working with a large corporate lender and they used a third party to do their mediation and so there again, we would sit down with mediation and then they had to go back to the lender and get their questions answered to see if, if our solution would be doable for them. So if you could support the farmer lender mediation extension that representative Lippert in Lippert's bill. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ripka. For sure. uh, our, I'm going to try uh, Ms. Dolan again. Ms. Dolan, are you there? Can you hear me? I sure can. Thank you, Chair Stevenson, members of the committee. My name is Nancy Deleen. I am testifying as a farmer who has used the farmer lender, meet, farmer lender mediation program in the past. <clears throat> My husband at the time became severely depressed after hearing the prices of commodities remaining low. As the lawyer's position was one that only one person in the marriage needed a legal notice, I lost valuable time. Finally, a young staff person called me at work and shared the situation I was in. The period to file for mediation was almost up and he sent the notice to an alternative address for me so I could see the situation. I immediately filed for mediation. I had to get a doctor's note for a leave of absence from work to deal with the situation. A new high risk case manager from our lender um, told me they could take everything in our household possessions and all and I would have opportunity to buy those things back as well as pay storage costs. I had really misunderstood his role in our case. That week, I lost 20 pounds. Mediation helped slow that process. At the mediation table, the lenders had to show their stuff. There were many lawyers, none of whom were local people. Two large loans given to us were executed by field staff. The documents revealed my signature was not, was not um, obtained by me. It was allowed to be done by my husband in the presence of those staff. They didn't want to bother me eight miles away in town at my job to get my signature. That week, I really did lose most of my hair. 
My husband was no longer functional. I filed in family court and tried to um, take control of this situation, but the calendaring at the local courthouse could not sync with the mediation schedule. Another staff told me not to talk about our situation for fear if we had other lenders, they too would take legal action. To the best of my knowledge, we had missed one farm payment. We had very few other lenders and those debts were small and I made those payments. I doubt very much you will see people actively involved in or just fresh out of mediation testify for these reasons. Two machinery dealers picked up our good tractor and hay buying, effectively closing a revenue source for me. They decided to be proactive as mediation was starting. There was equity in the machinery and from what I could see payments were up to date. It was springtime. I spray painted our name on the remaining machinery as I could not be home to guard the farm. My leave from work was not yet granted. The lawyers in my area were not skilled to be talking on the corporate be taking on the corporate lawyers whose sole job was asset protection and acquisition. It was a very obvious power imbalance in mediation. There are a number of legal people, myself and the mediator. The calendar was not helpful, but at least mediation gave me a little space to do a few things for my family. When finally I said at a final mediation meeting, you have my farm and home one corporate lender replied, yes, we do. I asked people to help me move as I did not have money to buy my possessions back. The attorneys also made it clear they could take any asset that they found my name on. So I immediately told my aging parents to take my name and my kids' names off their will, which they did. And we moved and our life was gone. <clears throat> After the mediation was complete, one corporation who had not followed their own programs for loans sent me certified mail, wanting me to sign documents where I would agree to never sue them nor my heirs. I never received a settlement statement, but certainly, certainly our case improved the corporation's bottom line. We had plenty of equity. I never signed those documents. Please, I implore you to continue the mediation program Please extend the number of days for mediation. I was grateful I had it so I could save some of what our family had, but I will stand for any question you would like to ask at this time. I support Representative Lippert's bill. Thank you for sharing that very difficult story with the committee. Uh, we now will move on to public testifiers on the bill. Uh, the first person to sign up is Mark uh, Meatkey. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yes, you did. And my name is Mark Midkey, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Minnesota Bankers Association. And I'm also president of Simpson State Bank of Hayfield. And we are a small ag bank down by Rochester, Minnesota. And I've been here long enough now that I also went through the farm crisis of the 80s when we, uh, the mediation program started in that uh, real crisis. And I'd just like to say that, that we encounter all sorts of different issues with our customers over time. And we always work with those people. It takes for years before uh, the problem really gets to the point where if we can't work something out where we need to go to mediation. And then if we do go to mediation and get something resolved, that's great. If we're getting something resolved and it comes to the end, we continue to work with that customer because those people are our neighbors. It's people we want to see continue in business. If something can't be resolved and it has to go into a liquidation, then that liquidation process in the case of real estate could take another year and a half. So through this whole process, by the time we start thinking there's a, a, an issue here, it can take two years before any collection is really done if it's involving real estate. And so I served on the task force in 2016 when we talked about uh, uh, extending mediation again. And the reason we had to do that is because in order to extend mediation, you have to declare a farm emergency. Otherwise, otherwise the bill is not constitutionally legal. So an, an emergency has to be declared in farming every uh, five years or however long it gets extended. And so that's the reason that, that it needs to be considered again. And, and I would really recommend that instead of just rushing through another extension, I really think you should form another committee and consider 
all of the options we've got available. If just talking about this isn't resolving the problem, maybe we need to look at some other options rather than just extending it because it, it, it just costs the customer more money the longer this goes. And maybe there's some better options to be, to be looked at rather than extending it because we know what the problems are coming up. And so when we get into that 60 day period, we already know the issues, we've talked about them. Let's see if there's any new ideas. If, there, if there's not, um, let's come up with some other options. Uh, the other thing that's happened now since the COVID crisis came in and technology has made it so that people can get together on a more regular basis instead of trying to plan traveling. They're actually able to plan more meetings because, because of technology. We can just do it over the phone. Um, and so that has really helped this whole process along. And so I guess maybe the state needs a little more technology as well. If that isn't the issue there, maybe we need to look at putting more money into that program. Uh, so those are just some of the, some of the issues I'd, I'd like you guys to consider uh, to maybe not rush into this right now. We've got another year to go yet and we can uh, form another committee, take a look at all the options and then come back to it next year. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, our last testifier is Brad Gruvort. Mr. Brubort. I can see you, but you're still muted, sir. There you are. Good afternoon. <clears throat> thank you, Chair Stevenson and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify with concerns on House File 80. Uh, my name is Brad Bruxport, and I am Vice President of First State Bank Southwest in Nadir, Minnesota, uh, representing the independent community bankers of Minnesota today. Uh, I have been a community banker since 1992. Our bank is familiar with the farmer lender mediation process and has conducted three mediations over the last five years of which I was involved. Uh, farmers are not only our customers, but our friends and neighbors, and we work hard to find a solution on difficult financial matters that works for everyone. That's what I, ICBM member banks do. When concerns regarding the farmer lender mediation program have arisen in the past, the legislature exercised caution and put together a task force of stakeholders in 2016 to discuss these matters. The task force issued recommendations in 2017, and there was no mention of a need to increase the mediation time period or increase the time period that creditors cannot enforce eligible debts like what is being proposed in this amendment. The biggest challenges with the mediation process concern time and accountability. While we are not opposed to working through the process of loan workouts, we believe that extending the time period of mediations will delay a solution from being reached, which may negatively affect the farmer. Longer mediation periods also tie up community banks' assets, preventing us from getting resources to struggling businesses and individuals that need them. The additional time allowed only softens the urgency of the situation that in some cases is the only thing that prompts the borrower to take action. My experience has been that if all parties are working in good faith, the mediation period can be extended as needed to accomplish the joint goals of the lender and the borrower. If there is further desire to look at the length of mediation periods or the period of time that creditors cannot enforce debts, we encourage legislators to pause and pull together stakeholders to study the data to see if such sweeping changes are necessary. There may be additional ways that can make the process work better for everyone without making arbitrary extensions. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you and I apologize for uh, my mispronunciation of your name as well. I'm, I'm really striking out on name pronunciations today. Uh, we are going to move to member discussion at this point. Uh, I do want to note it's seven minutes past the hour, uh, and we want to be cognizant of, of our, our time. We have one more bill we will get through today. So we're going to do about five or 10 minutes of discussion here and then move to vote. Uh, Representative Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And at the uh, risk of sounding too much like Representative Lucero, I, I want to tell the committee that um, that I've, I've taught farm business management and, and I'm currently an ag lender. And so I've, been, I've sat on both sides of the table. Uh, during uh, during lender mediation, um, and 
I've been involved in commercial, commercial and mediation as well. And interestingly enough, uh, those have lasted one day, one day. So if, if I, when I, when we've done those, it, it, it's you know, much shorter time frame. So again, if, if the farm doesn't do well, um, the bank doesn't do well. So the bank has a vested interest in, in uh, making sure that the farm does well. And this isn't, this isn't the first time that the farm has heard that, that there are in, there are issues here, so so I have concerns with extending the uh, the timeline. Um, as uh, as one of the lenders had mentioned, often the farm is in a position where it's losing equity by the week, and so we need to we need to get that um, get a plan in place to fix that. We uh, also have the ability when both sides agree and things are going well to extend that, and I've done that as well. So the the mechanism is in place to extend mediation when it's necessary. So again, the time is not necessarily on your side. And I, I think um, we've got another year to look at this. I think you know, there's there's some uh, things that we could look at to improve the process. I, I would just uh, recommend that we table this for a year and uh, um, take a look at it. We don't need to make a change today. So um, with that, I will uh, I will yield, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Farr. Representative Halen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think my question is for um, Mary uh, Priestler. I, I know I did not pronounce that right, uh, but I was wondering if she could describe the uh, U of M Extensions Office's process for mediation right now and how they have been doing that. Ms. Priestler, right? I guess. That is correct, Priestler. I you screwed up before, and so I, I, you know. You passed it to me. I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Ms. Priestler. All right. And what you're asking is of uh, the process that we use. Yes. Um, that's going to take some time to explain, uh, but uh, underneath the statute- Maybe you can give us a brief synopsis now and then I'm follow trying, up with I'm, Haley. I'm trying to formulate that in my mind here. <laughs> uh, the creditor, when they send out a letter, must send a copy of that letter to us that they are going to start mediation, the opportunity. They're going to give that opportunity for mediation to their customer. At that point, then we send out a packet to the customer explaining the mediation process and giving them also the forms and the resources that they can contact for help during the mediation process. Then they have 14 days to decide whether or not they would like mediation. When that 14 days is up, we if they have not requested mediation, then we release that creditor from mediation program and they can continue with whatever legal actions they need to take. If they request mediation, then at that point starts our um, selection of a mediator, gathering the financial information, setting up the meeting dates, getting everything coordinated so that we can have a, fruit, a fruitful session Within uh, two weeks of receiving that request for mediation, we'd like to hold a orientation session. At that point, we will find what kind of financial information are we lacking? Many times it's a lot. Uh, people by that time are very worked up and they're not thinking very clearly. And so um, we work and strive very hard to provide a financial person or a farm advocate or farm business management to help them to put together the financial information. Within 30 days of requesting mediation, we are required under state statute to hold the initial session. At that time, all of the creditors that they have listed for mediation are invited to come. And so we may have one creditor, we may have, we've had over 200 creditors. Ms. Chrysler, can, yes. can I ask you, it okay, sounds like- a, a, Do you have a brief follow-up and then- I do, and, and I, on, yeah, so. and I know you wanted to move on. Is Are any of these meetings in person? This sounds uh, complicated. And as I heard the other testifier, a very emotional and difficult process for many farmers. Are you meeting in person with them or is this all done over the phone? Ms. Pricely. At, Chairman, uh, at this point, we are, doing only on conference calls. There have been a few Zoom meetings, but we're finding that a lot of people don't have the 
the capacity to have a Zoom meeting. They don't have the internet that they need or the connections that they need. Under the University of Minnesota policy, we are asked not to have any face-to-face -face meetings. And that is until June 30th, unless they, unless they revise their policy. So okay. that leaves us only with the conference calls. Okay, and we're gonna have to, I'm gonna have to, uh, Reverend Haley, if you have a brief comment, but then I need to move on to Representative Driscoll. Uh, my only comment is it appears to me that that might be part of the problem is that people aren't allowed to meet in person um, to handle this complicated process at a difficult time in their uh, lives. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Preisler. Thank you, Representative Haley. Representative O'Driscoll. Mr. Chair, I was wondering if Representative Farr could yield a couple questions. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll, if you, you have, we'll give you a one question. We are running low on time here. Uh, what's your question for Representative Farr? Well, I'll make it a multiple part question to get my money's worth out of it, Mr. Chair. No, come on now. <laughs> um, well, I am. I'm trying to, to get to an answer on this. What we have not heard, Mr. Chair, and I think that Representative Farr can shed some light on this is mediation is not the first step. Mediation is a step. And my experience in the industry, and I would again like Mr. Uh, Representative Farr's comments on this, they, I'm assuming, are uh, getting contact with their customers, people who help keep their financial institution running and afloat, and try to work out things prior to going to mediation. Mediation is something I think that is used when the parties are not able to get together and work it through themselves, sort of a counseling session, and it's a one and done as an attempt to try to get things taken care of much like is done with labor negotiations if the two parties are unable to come to an agreement. I was wondering if Representative Farr can maybe comment a little bit on his experience with that. Representative Farr, any brief comments? Yeah, no, so correct. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's always a last resort, right? We, in my experience, I've talked to that customer over and over and over again, and we've tried to come to some agreement. And so it, it's, a, it's a third party that can help us get to a, a solution and find the best uh, solution for the farm. Thank you, Representative Farr. Representative Lippert, do you have any closing comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I do. I, mean, I think we heard from previous testifiers that the lending, the lending landscape has changed uh, pretty significantly. That it used to be that farmers were dealing with one lender, community lender, who was indeed a friend and a neighbor. And it may be that they're dealing with a community lender now. But even that community lender, um, that bank may have gone through some consolidation in the last few years, which is happen in my community and or and they may be dealing with a national lender at the same time like John Deere. So we're dealing with increasingly complex lending situations. And um, I think we can see how 90 days would go by very quickly in dealing with multiple lenders in multiple places with multiple interests or levels of interest in the relationships in a community and complex farm situations. Thank so you. Urge support for the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Lippert. Uh, I will renew my motion that House File 80 be uh, recommended to be referred to the Committee on Agricultural Finance and Policy. Mr. Brown will take the roll, and the chair votes aye. Vice Chair Cortezo Atun. Aye. Representative O'Driscoll. No. Representative Barr. Aye. Representative Carlson. Aye. Representative Daphne. Aye. Representative Elkins. Aye. Representative Haley. No. Representative Cagle. Aye. Representative Lee. Representative Lilly. Lilly, aye. Representative Lucero. No. Representative Olson. Aye. Representative Farr. No. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, no. Representative Richardson. Aye. Representative Tice. No. Representative Lee. With 10 ayes and six nays, the notion prevails, and House File 80 is recommended to be referred to the Committee on Agricultural Finance and Policy. Uh, thank you, Representative Lippert. Our last bill on the agenda today is House File 112. Uh, Representative Bernardi, welcome to the committee. I will move that House File 112 be recommended to be placed on the general register. Representative Bernardi, uh, to your bill. Chair and members of the committee, this bill before you, House File 112, accomplishes two goals. First, it requires people who own manufactured home parks to tell the park's residents, homeowners, if they're planning to sell. Second, it gives homeowners 60 days to put together an offer to buy the park. 
That's it. It doesn't require homeowners, uh, park owners to sell to the homeowners. It simply makes homeowners aware that the land their homes sit on is on the market and provides a short time frame for those homeowners to develop a bid for the park owner's consideration. If the park owner rejects the homeowner's bid, they let the homeowners know within five days. If the park owner accepts the homeowner's bid, the property must continue to be affordable housing for at least the next 50 years. Although manufactured home parks are affordable places to live, the affordability comes with significant risk. Park residents own their homes, but not the land under their home. The bill offers owners of these homes the opportunity to join with at least 51% of their fellow homeowners put an offer in on the land that's for sale. There are currently 900 manufactured home parks across the state and there are more than 180,000 Minnesotans who live there and call it home. Just over nine of those communities are owned by residents representing 700 home sites. Increasingly, parks are, are bought up by out-of-state investors. Representative Bernardi, you are muted uh, and we are running a little late on time. So if, if you could wrap up your introduction, I see multiple members who have questions. We, we Did I just get muted or the you whole time? You just got muted a second oh, ago. Thank, good, thank goodness. Well, okay, so I'd like, so a lot are being sold to out-of-state investors. I'd like to underscore the most important things to understand about this bill. The bill does not force a landowner to sell to the residents. That exclusive right remains to the landowner and the bill does not lower the potential sale of the park. The bill at its core is simply replacing Minnesota's current sale notice requirement, which is not working with one that will work. The current notice requirement only applies in incident instances where property is publicly listed for sale, but the vast majority of parts sold are never sold. So with that, House File 12 simply gives homeowners the opportunity to put in an offer to buy the land in which where they live, it's an opportunity for these families and individuals to remain connected to their schools, jobs, and neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, we will move now to testifiers. And uh, in the interest of time, I'll ask each testifier to uh, limit their comments to one minute, 60 seconds. So uh, the first testifier is uh, Natividad Seafield, Ms. Seafield. And I'm not sure we have Ms. Seafield, so in the interest of time, I'll move to the- oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you, um, Representative Stevenson and members of the committee. My name is Natividad Seafield. I own a home in the city of Fridley in um, Park Positive Cooperative, a manufactured home community. Our cooperative is home to 83 families and two new babies on the way. I am fortunate to live in one of Minnesota's nine resident owned manufactured home communities. Park Plaza became a resident-owned community on February 15, 2011, 10 years ago last month, and I serve as the current president of the board of directors for Park Plaza Cooperative. Before 2011, I had lived with the same uncertainty at, that 45,000 Minnesota families face every day. Is this the day I receive the notice that I have to move because the park is being closed? Is this the day my family aunt finds out if they are forced to leave our home, job, friends, and family? Or will it be like so many other days, a day where my neighbors and I keep asking for repairs and improvements that never happen, a day where the community rules are unfairly applied, a day when rent gets raised on a whim? But not in our community. I do not hear... I do not fear losing my home. My neighbors and I make improvements to our homes. We know it's an investment and we won't lose it because someone outside our community decided to sell the land. Okay, thank you, Ms. Seafield. I'm sorry, but we, uh, we have to be strict on time right now in order to make it through. Uh, the next testifier is Mr. Mark Brunner. Mr. Brunner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mark Brunner, Manufactured Modular Home Association of Minnesota. Uh, and actually the, the bill is a, a solution in search of a problem and in the process eliminates fundamental property rights of manufactured home community owners to sell their property. Minnesota right now is one of the top states in the nation in providing residents of manufactured home communities with the opportunity to purchase their community when it's offered for sale. There's a required 
uh, notice of sale that goes to every resident every time a community is listed with a real estate broker or offered for sale in a, uh, in a publication. That opportunity exists today. Uh, there are nine cooperative communities in Minnesota right now. All of those have happened under current law where they've come forward, made an offer to the community owner to purchase the property. And there's been a, a willing seller and a willing buyer. That process has, uh, uh, has worked well. The bill takes away, though, a fundamental property right in being a community owner, being able to offer an option to someone to purchase their property. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Brunner. Uh, our, I'm sorry, your minute is up. Our next testifier is Michelle Carlson. Ms. Carlson. Thank you, Chair Stevenson and committee members. My name is Michelle Carlson. I'm a second generation manufactured home community owner. I live in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, have worked in the industry for 25 some years. We specialize in property management. I'm an active voice with MMHA, Habitat for Humanity and other local chamber. I have a community in Duluth, Minnesota with 500 home sites and those that community we've had for over 40 years. Um, we certainly have concerns with House File 112 in maintaining my ability to sell my community in the future. And um, this is the community I've developed, invested in, and has been my livelihood for 25 years. We see that this bill would take away the fundamental right of a community owner to, um, to grant a, by granting a right of first option to purchase, giving it to this nonprofit buyer, resulting in a, a significant loss of income without just compensation. Also, it takes away our right to package more than one property together, including a licensed sales center, a in installation business, a mini story business. It would also delay a sale four to six months, perhaps deterring property sale completely. It's a real unfair taking of property rights. And why Thank should you, Ms. Carlson, I'm sorry your time has expired. Uh, the next testifier is Mike Schrader, Mr. Schrader. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Stevenson, members, uh, uh, it sounds like I got less than a minute, so I'm going to piggyback on Michelle and Mark. Uh, our family's been in this business for 50 years. We own 12 communities in three different states. Um, uh, contrary to uh, Ms. Bernardi's uh, representations, this bill is not as simple as she uh, indicates. It's very convoluted. The notice requirements are unreasonable. And essentially it's teeing this up for the Aeons and North Country co-ops of the world to come in and uh, negotiate things down. Uh, it has a good faith uh, uh, language component, but I don't think I, that's like saying, you know, adding reasonableness language to a statute doesn't exist. I, where we're at, uh, there'd be 91 days before you could even determine to sell a property to a third party uh, as a commercial realtor that uh, essentially has a chilling effect on all realistic third party marketing of the property and tees it up for a specified preemptive right in these nonprofits, it's very unfair. And I find it to be a, a restraint on commerce and um, I'm kind of angry about it. Thank you, Mr. Schrader. Uh, our last public testifier is Paul Egger, Mr. Egger. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Paul Egger and I'm Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Minnesota Realtors Association. We have two primary concerns with the bill. One of the fundamental property or rights of any property owner is the ability to freely market and sell their property without unreasonable restrictions. An owner of any property, including a manufactured home park, may have numerous business and or personal reasons for deciding to sell a property and then when to put the property on the market. By creating this opportunity to purchase process, House File 112 would substantially interfere with this important property right. On the purchase side, residents are already free to put in an offer in any park when the property goes on the market. And as Mr. Bruner mentioned, there's already a notice of sale provision in statute. Second concern we have is that this bill adversely affects the timeliness of the real estate transaction. And you can review the bill and see that there's the potential for a 91 day delay if the owner does not accept the offer submitted by the residents. Meanwhile, there, are, there may be potential buyers with the resources to purchase and invest in the property, but who are not willing to or able to wait out the delay mandated by this bill. Thank you for thank the you, opportunity. Mr. Yep, thank you, Mr. Egger. We have two minutes for member uh, discussion, so I'll ask members to take 30 seconds each. Uh, the first uh, member is Representative Farr. Representative Farr. 
Yes, to the bills offer. So where else in state law do we require an owner of an asset to give 60 days notice that they plan to sell that asset? Representative Bernardi, if you have a very brief answer to that question. I would have to defer that to our uh, house research. Okay, Representative uh, O'Driscoll. Wow, 30 seconds on the most controversial bill we've got today here. Well, I'll just start until the chair cuts me off. Um, I think this will lead to less options for folks for affordable housing when we um, look at this. A deal that has been made with a third party buyer and then having to offer this to residents, the uh, financing situation could fall out of bed, the rates could change and the owner could be left with no option because the bird in the hand had to wait for the two in the bush to sell to the residents. I, again, I don't think that um, this also supports privacy of the owner who may doesn't, maybe doesn't want to let other folks know that they're in the process of selling property for various and sundry reasons. And it's granted, this is taking uh, people's private rights without uh, any real due process. Uh, you, I suspect that this- uh, We need to get to everybody who's on the list. Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, my principal concern with you know, this is that you know, when there's an option to buy, uh, that has value, that has value in the real estate market. And so my question is to the bill author, Mr. Chair, um, on, on how she would address you know, concerns that this is essentially a, a legislative taking. Representative Bernardi, if you have a brief answer. I would say that the owner gets to make the decision who they purchase, the, uh, who purchases their homes. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a comment and then a question. The comment is, uh, this is just another example of government interfering with the value of private property. As a commercial property owner myself, I had leases expire in my commercial properties during this, this unnecessary COVID lockdown by Governor Walls. And it had forced me as a private property owner to negotiate a lower lease. I had to go $500 per month lower in the negotiation because of the softening of the commercial market due to Governor Walls. This is exactly what this would do, this bill would do to this, these private property owners. It gets government in the way and it lowers the value. Thank you, Representative value. Lucero. The uh, question for the, the bill author is- We don't have time for a question. We don't have time, so how do we vet? Is this a sham? We're not no. actually vetting the legislation. Do you have a comment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just like to say that um, I'm all for a lot of different things when it comes to these manufactured parks. We need more of them, but we need to find a better way to do this uh, when I hear 50 years, it's like, holy smokes, so much changes in them. And at that, I really wish that we could work on this a little bit more, but I do understand the need for it. But I would like to see us work a little bit more about what works for both sides because we're not carrying it. And we really do need the housing. It is. Thank you, Representative Tice. I will renew the motion that House File 112 be placed on the general register. <laughs> Brown will take the roll. The chair votes aye. Vice Chair Katiza Watoon. Aye. Representative O'Driscoll. No. Representative Barr. No. Representative Carlson. Aye. Representative Daphne. Aye. Representative Elkins. Aye. Representative Haley. No. Representative Cagle. Aye. Representative Lee. Lee, aye. Representative Lilly. Aye. Representative Lucero. Pity and name only. No. Representative Olson. Aye. Representative Farr. No. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, no. Representative Richardson. Aye. Representative Tice. No. With 10 mm -hmm. ayes and seven nays, the motion prevails and House File 112 is recommended to be placed in the general register and the meeting is adjourned.